This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Les Gelb, who is Emeritus Professor of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. His new book is Power Rules, How Common Sense Can Rescue American Foreign Policy. Les, welcome back to Berkeley. Good to be here. Where were you born and raised? New Rochelle, New York. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? My parents were immigrants from uh, originally Hungary, but by the time they left it, it was the Czech Republic. Today it's Ukraine, by the way. Huh. It was this little piece of property in the far east part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire up against the Carpathian Mountains. Mm -hmm. It's like the uh, Appalachia of Europe. And they were essentially uneducated immigrants. Their fifth grade education came here and worked in a grocery store, corner grocery store, their whole lives. And what got you interested in international politics? Did they talk about politics around the dinner table, or was it really school that did that for you? There was not much of a dinner table. We ate in the back of the store mm -hmm. uh, one, a, one at a time. It wasn't like that. My father was interested in, in politics but it was not a, uh, a passion. It was something that I think happened in college because being a politics major, a government major, was easier than doing anything else. <laughs> I see, and where did you uh, uh, live that easy life as an undergraduate? I went to Tufts, mm -hmm. and it was the only place that accepted me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't have much choice, and it turned out to be a lucky marriage. It's a good place for me. And your graduate work was at Harvard, right? I was right? at Harvard. I have a PhD from Harvard. And, and who did you work under there? Principally two people in international affairs, Stanley Hoffman and Henry Kissinger. Mm -hmm. And uh, after you got your degrees, you, you, you went into to government service right away. You, you chose not to be, become a professional. No, I wasn't. Uh, a, I or was did a, you? I was an associate, assistant professor at Wesleyan. I see, okay. Which is where I met your former colleague, my friend Nelson Polsby. I see, okay. And, uh, but then, brief then. Brief period. Brief, for, uh, teaching a brief right. period, right. And, uh, and I guess throughout your very distinguished career, you've run into academics and run up against them as, as you've sought to bring new ideas. But, but you, you went into government service after that and worked for Senator uh, Javits. That's right, he brought me to Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking back at your career, which I know something about because you visited the campus uh, several times, uh, you, you, we, one can say that you, g g uh, paraphrasing the 60s song, you've seen foreign policy from all sides, uh, I believe. You were, I should mention to our audience that you were assistant to Javits, you were in McNamara's Pentagon where you edited uh, the, uh, the uh, Pentagon Papers, you were at the State Department under Jimmy Carter in policy planning, you were a columnist and uh, 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 editorial, uh, op-ed page editor of the New York Times and then at the Council. So you've seen it all. Yeah, I've done a lot of different things. And, and how all the institutions sort of play. So why did you write this book? I think I wrote it out of uh, uh, unlimited frustration mm -hmm. at my field. Because uh, for most of the time I've been in this business, I felt that most of the answers to foreign policy problems were common sense. Mm. And uh, I saw the professionals more or less gravitating to something we could accomplish rather than something where we would fail, mm. something that was within our means. And then I saw what I call in the book the demons mm -hmm. take over, mm -hmm. the demons of ideology or dog dogma, uh, America can uh, uh, 
uh, achieve democracy and freedom and all the good things for the world. Uh, we, can do, we can defeat communism, uh, the uh, demon of politics, and the demon of the arrogance of power. Mm -hmm. And once those demons get hold of a problem, common sense goes to the wind. Mm -hmm. and, and in your book and throughout your book, you, you, you actually fault both the left and the right when, yes. when you're talking about uh, 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 ideology. And it, it, it's, it's as if that both on the left and the right, they, they, their ideas are, are too big for what any great power can do in international politics. On both sides, I think so. Uh, and particularly over the issue of what is power. Because having spent my life in this business, uh, I think that whoever gets to define power gets to control foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And when the left was controlling in the Clinton years, uh, essentially they said, hey, America is dominant, the Cold War is over, we won, we're at the top of the mountain alone. We can now rule through love, mm -hmm. through persuasion, understanding, leadership, moral values. And they called it soft power, mm -hmm. which is, to me, a contradiction in terms. Power is not a soft thing. Uh, and they misled themselves into thinking that uh, by understanding people, sitting down and reasoning with them, you could get a nation to change its position on a matter of vital interest. That just isn't the way things work. Mm -hmm. On the other side, the conservatives or the Republicans also saw us alone at the top of the mountain after the Cold War. We could do anything. All we had to do was to go use our total military superiority or threaten to use it, and the world would bend to our will. It's a matter of military strength and will. And this was hard power. And of course, what they call hard power wasn't power either. It was physical force. Mm -hmm. Power, and I think it's critical to get back to what it is. Power is not an intellectual process like persuasion, and it's not a physical process like force, although they play into power. Uh, power is about pressure and coercion. It's about uh, using your resources as carrots and sticks to manipulate others mm -hmm. politically, psychologically, to get them to do something they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And it's all good and well to try reason first. It may help the medicine go down later on. And you may not be able to solve it with your solve the problem with your power, and if the issue is really important, uh, you may have to use physical force. But power is that middle range, and it's important for us to understand that because that's how we ought to try to solve a lot of the problems we haven't been able to solve. Right, and, and importantly, I think we should note that in your book, you actually go back to your academic roots to find that, that, that uh, very, uh, precise definition, you, you go back to Robert Dahl. Sure. And uh, so... Uh, or Hans Morgenthau, the same thing. Right, right. And, and I guess that, that in the literature, for example, international politics, there was always an understanding of, of the difference between ends and means. And it, it, the, it, when you look at power, the problem that comes up again and again in our history and in your book is uh, what is ancillary to power is perceived by our leaders often as what power is. So persuasion is useful, yes. reasoning is useful, military power, uh, a military force it's sometimes is sometimes necessary. Yes, yeah, sometimes, but but that's not the core of, of right. the way you move things in politics. That's right, and to use power in the sense I'm describing it, which is the classical definition. Uh, makes you realize that it's very hard to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, that you've got to know what buttons to push in other societies, which means knowing other leaders in other societies very well. And it means that you have to get time for yourself to let your power play out. It's not a matter of giving orders. Uh, it, when, when, when one goes through your discussion of power, you, you have a sense of, that it's hard work in a way, exactly. especially for a leader, because he's got to decide, 
this is what I want to do, or these are the several things that I want to do because they're in our vital interest. But on the other hand, uh, he has to find the means to do it. And, and, and this hard work, if you look at both Bush and Clinton, it strikes me, it strikes me that, that the idea that they came up with, there is a strong element of irresponsibility because they wind up saying, okay, foreign policy and power gets done by Clinton uh, through globalization. Mm -hmm. So it just sort of the market takes care of everything. Yes. Whereas Bush did the same thing with military power. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, so we we have this problem, but then, so so in in the end, the the demons that you're talking about interfere with our seeing what power is. So that strikes me as one very important pillar of the book. But but where you then take us is to say the world has changed. The yes. 21st century is very different. So once we know what power is, then we have to ask, well, what's the world like today? So, so give us a sense of how you see international politics in the 21st century and, and, and the degree to which mm -hmm. we're misperceiving it. Well, let me try to clear up something I did to some degree in the book, which has become very pronounced in the last few weeks in the discussion of President Obama's trip to Europe. Mm -hmm. That is, you have one commentator after another getting up and saying, the United States is no longer dominant the way we used to be. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't know what they're talking about. We were never dominant in the sense that we could tell other countries what to do. During the Cold War, there was a place, I think, called the Soviet Union. Yes, that was that. <laughs> Soviet Union. And they didn't do what we tell them to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, they ran a good part of the show during those years. And even after the fall of the Soviet Union, we weren't dictating to others this new world order. It was a phrase. Uh, but they still did pretty much what they wanted here and there, unless we had a clear purpose in mind, and unless we led in a certain direction, gathered others up to uh, add their power to ours, and solved the problem. But we never dominated. This is a fiction of discourse now, which is participated in not only by the people who do cable news, where you expect this sort of thing, but by serious foreign policy experts. So they talk about the age of dominance is gone. It never existed. Now, the, uh, the point that they make that is correct is that we are less power, powerful relative to the others than we used to be. But here's the fact of the matter. The world isn't flat, the Tom Friedman thesis, mm -hmm. uh, where the power has been leveled by the economic process and interdependence. I can only use one word to describe that thesis, nonsense. The, the world is still highly pyramidal in power, and the United States remains alone at the top. There is a new group of countries right below the United States, I call them the eight, consisting of Germany, uh, France, Britain, Japan, China, India, Russia, and Brazil. Uh, they're what I call key players or key partners in this. And the essential power principle that we've got to understand in order to get something done is one, we are the indispensable leader. Mm -hmm. This is not the post-American era. It's still the era where America is the sole leader and the indispensable leader in solving mm -hmm. any major international problem. And every other country in the world realizes this. But to get the problem solved, requires that we, we take on equally indispensable partners, mainly from the eight. And we have a situation then of what is obviously mutual indispensability, mm -hmm. us as the leader, uh, the others as the, as the partners. Fail alone, succeed together. That's the moral of this power story. And that's what we have to understand. And I must say, Listening to President Obama on this European trip, he seems to get it. Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, importantly, uh, this uh, 
mutual indispensability uh, requiring American leadership to solve problems uh, is a more realistic assessment of power in the world. Because as you point out, and you, you, we couldn't tell Cuba what to do, basically, even in the bipolar world. And now in right. this world, uh, uh, at all levels, people have been empowered to block, basically, when, yes. when you try to coerce. Yes, the, the power to resist has grown exponentially compared to almost all previous history, when the strong more or less dominated the weak. That's the story of international relations. Well, there are two stories. The strong fighting each other, they had a very good time, and the strong dominating the weak, which was relatively easy, because you conquer a capital, you conquer the leadership, you conquer the tribe or the nation or the country. It was as simple as that. Now you have these nations that can resist you, and the cost is very high. And that's what we missed. That's what all these foreign policy experts who talk about American dominance don't seem to remember at all. Mm -hmm. Tito defying Stalin at the end of World War II. Vietnam, North Vietnamese defeating both the French and us. The Afghans defeating the Soviet Union and so forth. It became more and more difficult for the strong to dominate the weak as they had done throughout history. And the best example of all, all this is of course Cuba. Cuba is 90 miles off our shore. It's been giving us a strategic hot foot for 50 years. Mm -hmm. There's no other period in history where a little inconsequential power like that could have been off uh, uh, the coast of a major power and survived more than a week. Mm -hmm. They would have been wiped out. And here it is 50 years later, still doing its thing. Mm -hmm. Now, in, as you, 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 in your book, you go through the history of uh, uh, American foreign policy since World War II, and, and you do find examples of leaders who have understood power and, and uh, achieved positive roles, results. Truman. Uh, with the Marshall Plan, the aiding of our allies, uh, Kissinger uh, and Nixon uh, in their triangular diplomacy and setting the stage for the Middle East, and then Bush and Baker. Uh, talk a little about in those. The Cold War. In closing the yes. Cold War. Talk a little about those cases because what was it about uh, those individuals and their context and the politics of the day that, that uh, let them act with an understanding of power and achieve very important results. Right. I wish I knew the full answer to that because I'm jealous. <laughs> the, the, these three examples that I use several times in the book mm -hmm. show that we do know how to get it right. And we did so at critical moments which turned out to be absolutely essential for our winning the Cold War. I mean, start with Truman, Marshall, and Atchison. Uh, they were the best of all because they understood we needed to do two things. One was to establish new international institutions to solve a myriad of new problems uh, with the United States in the lead, not dictating, but leading the others. And we know them all, you name them, the World Bank, NATO, etc. They still exist today. They were, they're that good. Mm -hmm. They exist today. The other thing they realized is that we couldn't put our power into crises over which we had little control. We had to go to strength, build situations of strength. And so they focused American power and resources on building up Western Europe, Germany in particular, and Japan. And the theory of the power was quite simple. Mm -hmm. If we built those places up, particularly Germany and Japan, added their resources to our own, we would have more than 75% of all the military, diplomatic, and economic power in the world. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't lose the Cold War. And they were right. That was the, ultimately the basis of our winning. It's a very practical, common sense principle that's almost gotten lost entirely. Go to strength, don't hinge your power to weakness. When the Soviet Union at the end of World War II had five million men under arms in Europe and took over Eastern Europe, they said our best use of our power is not to fight them over Eastern Europe. Mm. And last I looked, we won the Cold War. Mao took over China 
And everybody said, go to war with him. You can't let him take over China. We'll, we'll lose our security, our freedom. Well, last I looked, they were our biggest lenders, you know? We lost the Vietnam War, and uh, three years after we took our people off the rooftops of our embassy in Saigon, our position in Asia was stronger than it had been at any time since the end of World War II. And Nixon and Kissinger, who screwed up over Vietnam, smothered the ill effects of losing the war. Mm -hmm. They smothered it in triangular diplomacy, in the Middle East Agreement, and in reestablishing our position in Asia by playing off growing fears of an emerging China. Mm -hmm. So they knew how to do it then, too. And the third example is, of course, George H.W. Bush and Baker and Scowcroft in handling the close of the Cold War, where they ended the Cold War without war. They uh, allowed Gorbachev to dismantle the Soviet Empire and ultimately the Soviet Union itself without insisting on American terms. Although there were people here banging the drums, mm -hmm. tell Gorbachev what to do. He's a dirty, rotten commie. He's not doing what he's saying. These were brilliant examples, and that's why we emerged from that incredibly tense period in our history victorious. Now, now what, what was it about these different sets of leaders that transcended the demons that you made a mention of before, which, which are at the root of a lot of our problems in, in understanding power and using it? Uh, was it the, the particular political situation they're seeing and understanding power and then acting accordingly? Yeah, I think in, in all three cases, they made a clear judgment of what was attainable and what wasn't, what was important and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. And they stuck by it. You had the idiots jumping up and down on the outside saying, oh, we don't have to do any of this, there are no threats at all, and the others saying go to war. They resisted it. And they stayed in that middle range of what power really is and essentially leaned on the problems. Mm -hmm. And America still has the kind of power that if you are lean and you've got others leaning with you, like a Germany and Japan during that Cold War, or even today adding their economies to ours, eventually it has its effects. You just have to be clever enough to buy the time to let that leaning power take effect. Mm -hmm. and, and interestingly enough, uh, especially in the first two cases, uh, you, you can see that they understood that they could take this American dominance across issues uh, uh, and, and essentially use that and it, America's ability to be a balancer in different regions yeah, exactly. to, to achieve a result, basically. Exactly. So, so I guess, now, now when, when we look at this last one, this last example, what, what, what is quite interesting is the wreckage uh, that emerged because uh, the wreckage, by wreckage, I don't mean the wreckage in the world, I mean the wreckage of the history, that basically what won the Cold War uh, essentially became the occasion for uh, a misunderstanding projecting into the future. So, so in the foreign policy debate, when we get to domestic politics, well, how did the Cold War end without war? Well, it ended because of America's military power, it is alleged, or we bankrupt. Talk a little about that, because what, what I'm trying to get at is the after effects of success then exactly. are in, misinterpreted in the political arguments, which then lead us back to not understanding power or history. That's quite Right, right. That's, and that's precisely what happened. Yeah. Because we did win the Cold War. And it's hard to find a period in history uh, equal to that, where the other power disappeared without a mighty war. Mm -hmm. And here we were left uh, on top by ourselves. And it was a heady experience. Mm -hmm. And it let loose uh, all the worst instincts of both the left and the right mm -hmm. and how they thought about getting our way in the world. Uh, I, uh, I in in your 
laying out for us the configuration of power, you talk about the U.S. at the top across issues in a world where there's a second tier of powers that we need to win over right. uh, and that uh, can block but can be part of the coalition to solve problems. But down Correct. below, are you, you, you talk, so, so we have a, on the one hand a concentration of power, but then uh, at the bottom we have what you call the splitting of power. Talk about that yes. and, and what its implications for how we would look at some of the problems that President Obama right. is facing. It's a very good question and, and I do deal with it in the book in, in several places. Two things. First of all, our power to lead really comes from our power to solve common problems. If we can figure out how to define the problem and attack it in a way consistent with how others see it, uh, then we have a chance of solving that problem. If, we, if our power used in that fashion doesn't solve the problem, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's power to solve problems. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the others have the power to resist, and they do. Take a look at puny North Korea today. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a country where people are starving. The economy is near zero. They are launching a missile, and we're jumping up and down going crazy about it. To, to me, that's an example of not understanding power. Kim Jong-il, the head of, uh, of North Korea, uh, has got nothing to offer except the fear he can engender uh, in South Korea, Japan, United States, and so forth. And that's the only time he gets any attention because his country isn't uh, worth a damn the way they've ruled it. And then we rea react every time. Every time he provokes us, we get provoked. And we give him uh, some leverage again. Now, it's very difficult even for a powerful coalition, the one that we've assembled to deal with him, Russia, China, Japan, South Korea, ourselves, to get the job done because our main leverage here is not military. Mm -hmm. We're not going to attack him. And the main reason we're not going to attack him and we could destroy North Korea, is that South Korea doesn't want us to attack them because if we did, they'd get destroyed. Mm -hmm. They don't want to play that game. We'd never have another ally again. So our main power is economic because that country is an economic basket case. But uh, the uh, economic sword on our part is double-edged as far as the North Koreans are concerned. On the one hand, they need it because the country is so poor in need of energy and food and whatever. But on the other hand, they realize that if they open up their country to the global economy, they are gone. Mm -hmm. And so everything becomes very difficult in, in dealing with them. And you have to be very patient and not turn missile tests, which, by the way, are legal. There's no treaty that bans missile tests, mm -hmm. into uh, great occasions for a test of wills, because what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. have another UN resolution, mm -hmm. that's amusing. Mm -hmm. you, you point out that, that one of the uh, uh, things that happened in this re recent period under the second President Bush is that we disaggregated the package of carrots and sticks uh, on particular policies, uh, and, and uh, you know, then we were left only with military power, which couldn't achieve uh, exactly. the goal that we, both in Iraq and in the case of North Korea, except at that point at which we began negotiating with this five power group. Right. Uh, no, that's exactly what happens. And to this day, Iraq is a very good example. To this day, we don't understand why we're doing better in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Uh, everything gets reduced to the word surge, mm -hmm. which people translate as the increase in our military strength in Iraq. Well, we increased it by about 23,000 troops. Mm -hmm. And that was the least part of quieting that situation. Mm -hmm. Much more important than that small increase in troops was we completely changed military strategy. Instead of our troops being in bases, they got out on the streets, mm -hmm. and they are formidable. Secondly, and more importantly, uh, the Muqtada Sadr rebels, the Shiite rebels, in effect, uh, went hiding, and they stopped fighting. Mm -hmm. We still don't quite understand why, 
but they had been a major source of trouble for us. Third, and even more important, is that we were fighting the former Saddam allies, the Ba'athists. They were the insurgents working with Al Qaeda. But it was plain for everyone to see that Al Qaeda was doing far more damage to the Sunnis who lived in the central part of Iraq than they were doing to us. Mm. But we wouldn't ally with them. And finally, we, we did through the awakening movement, and we started to pay them. Mm -hmm. Instead so of the bad right. guys <laughs> paying them, we paid them. <laughs> yeah. And that was the biggest shift. And then, miraculously, Maliki, whom Bush was going to get rid of, they even leaked a White House memo saying, this guy is adult, he's hopeless, we need another leader. Maliki turned into a great leader, sent his troops down to Basra, beat up on the, uh, the gangsters who were trying to take over the place, and has been a fairly adequate strong man since then. Mm -hmm. So that's the real surge. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't military force, it was all these other things that happened more as a result of our power than as a result of putting 23,000 more troops into Iraq. So, so in a way, common when you say common sense, how it can change our foreign policy, you really mean both insight and understanding about what power is, and then just making choices that move us along in what we've want to exactly. achieve. You, when you tell a story, which I think is very important, when you come to the Council on Foreign Relations, you uh, realize the importance that political economy was going to have in the world, and, and you wanted the Council to sort of focus on this yes. set of problems, and, and you found resistance. Talk about that, because uh, I think a theme that's running through your book, it's, it's very important to bring new ideas to new sets of problems always understanding power, how to use it, but also the configuration of power in the world. Talk a little about that. Absolutely. It was very important to me. It remains very important to me. Uh, my buddies in the foreign policy community did get the point that military force was generally becoming less important than it used to in the history we all studied, and that economics was becoming more important. But we were not going forward with the conclusion of that insight, mm -hmm. namely, we had to learn how to inter integrate the economics better into our foreign policy, since it was now such a central instrument of power. Uh, and <clears throat> other countries knew how to do it. It came naturally to the, the study of political economy. We don't study that here in the United States. You have the economics department, you have the political science department, and never the twain shall meet. Most foreign policy experts know almost nothing about economics and finance and vice versa. So we couldn't take advantage of our new main element of superiority, our economy. And it was difficult for another reason. In the American economy, more so than almost all major uh, economies in the, in the world, the president has less authority than his counterparts. Uh, government has more control. Now, this may change in view of what's happening right now, but historically, we have a private enterprise system over, the, over which the president uh, lacked the kind of control he had over the military or over our diplomatic positions. But this is something we have to learn to do better because it is more and more at the core of international power. You, you say in the book that, that when you look under the rock, the other problem when we're talking about political economy issues is that often the, uh, uh, the Treasury and the State Department aren't on the same page or aren't talking to each other. Yeah, uh, they, they generally don't. They, Treasury looks at the problems from an economic point of view, and they get very unhappy when the State Department intrudes with these political considerations, which will spoil mm -hmm. uh, some elegant economic outcome that they're, mm -hmm. they're hoping for. And of course, the State Department people are saying, these guys are missing the point. Uh, it's, this problem is not gonna be solved or turn on an economic solution. There's a core political problem underneath it. And so they're generally at loggerheads. This administration is making the umpty umpth try since Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon at fixing the problem. And they've named a very able man by the name of Michael Froman to head it up, uh, who's one of the best guys I, I know. Uh, but he has no particular background in it, and the bureaucracy still isn't 
set mm -hmm. mentally to operate that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're not getting full advantage of our power. Yeah, yeah you, th there's a, an anecdote in your book which I actually thought was very significant and I want to just probe it because this is about new ideas and how you get fresh thinking. You, you're the editor of the opinion page of the New York Times. You hear about a governor in Arkansas who you've never met uh, who's, uh, and you call him, I don't even right. remember what the problem was, and you're calling to ask him to write an opinion page. Infrastructure. Uh, yeah, it was on infrastructure. He dazzles you with your brilliance. With his uh, brilliance. With his brilliance. Yeah, with his brilliance. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, and he, at the end of the conversation, you and this is Bill Clinton, the governor of Arkansas. Right. Tell us, tell us the end of that story. Well, what happened? We talked for about an hour, and he, it was stunning how much he knew. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the hour, I said, "So you'll do a piece for me for the op-ed page?" He said, "Sure, sure." Uh, but what do you want me to say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the reason why I think that story is very important is, what, what is the, help us understand how you move beyond the idea of the conventional wisdom. Because I think one way to interpret that story is to say, well, what do you want me to say? And I'll say it, you know, uh, w with in, in the context of the conventional. But I think what you're asking is give me a new idea. Give me a new way to approach this. Yeah, what I wanted him to do, in effect, was to say in writing what he had told me on the phone. Yeah. I thought it was a, st a stunning exposition of how central rebuilding our infrastructure was to making sure we stayed on top economically, stayed competitive economically, because there's almost no better way to promote economic growth than build infrastructure. It creates jobs on the spot, and it uh, facilitates the economy in the future, makes everything more efficient. So let's talk a little about the current economic crisis and how uh, uh, we can understand it in the context of your ideas. But, but, but first I want to start with what, what, what happened here? Was everybody uh, drinking uh, the same Kool-Aid that essentially had been uh, tainted with a bad idea? Yeah, I mean, the, the good idea for them was they made a lot of money. And they still have it, those who made it. <laughs> so for them, it's still a good yeah. idea. And for the rest of us, it's a horrible idea. And it was essentially greed, and I think it was fraud. They figured out how to defraud the country by speculating in assets they knew to be almost worthless or worthless. And the joke in the end was on us, and I mean all of us, Americans and the world. Mm -hmm. Now, do you do you think that uh, <clears throat> let's look at the trajectory of the response to the crisis? Do you uh, and we move from the W administration to Obama's administration? Do you see evidence uh, that uh, conforms with the way you think we should deal with our power and approach these problems? It seems so. Uh, uh, a lot of things that President Obama says or Secretary Hillary Clinton says make a lot of good sense and are consistent with uh, what we're talking about here. And I'm pleased for that. But there are other things that kind of disturb me or wor make me worry about really what is going on. One thing is they're making good decisions about everything. Mm -hmm. And as I, <laughs> as I say in the book, Everything is against strategy. Strategy is making choices. And to me, the uh, far and away the most important issue now is to get the economy under control and back on track. That should be our first, second, third, and fourth priority. Mm -hmm. And these other issues, we've got to deal with them one way or another, but we should not make the crises around the world the center of our universe the way we do. You mean uh, the security crises? Or, yes, yeah. the security crises oh, yeah. like Afghanistan, Pakistan, North Korea, Iran, Middle East, whatnot. We've got to deal with them. But they can't be put on the same plateau as the economy. And I'm worried that our president doesn't realize that in order to get something done on the economy, not simply say smart things, he's going to have to be at it almost all the time because there's a huge gap between the policy you announce and getting something done, working through all the mechanisms, private and public, to make it happen. Those mechanisms don't exist now. 
Mm -hmm. And they will be critical to actually making his policy work or finding out if it's working. So, but every day he's issuing a new pronouncement on some major policy issue. And I think the fundamental choice that has to be made is between the economy on the one hand going to strength the way Truman, Marshall, and Atchison did, uh, and focusing on the crises where our control is weakest, where our power is least effective, and where even if we do things right, events might turn out badly for us. And what I'm saying is we can survive those crises. We can't survive a weakening, a fundamental weakening of our economy. It's the basis of our democracy, and it is the basis of the very international power that people are clamoring for us to have. Mm -hmm. you, you say you're, you're talking about the dilemmas that a president uh, uh, deals with, and, and one item is this choosing, and you actually say something, you say pa a policy says hold on to the options, but power says choose. So that is both within a particular issue mm -hmm. and between issues. And you just told us that we need to focus more on the economy. Now, now you in your career were in the Pentagon, you authored uh, you, I'm sorry, not authored, you, you edited, you brought I was together. the director of the project. The director of the project, uh, the Pentagon Papers. When, when we look at Afghanistan and Pakistan, do you worry that we're getting into another quagmire? Obviously, you've just made a point about choosing your priorities, but once you're in that priority. And here, I, I want to raise a question, which you must have encountered, and that is, uh, the problem that we have with our foreign policy that it's always the usual suspects we're rounding up because it would seem sometimes we get bad ideas or we don't embrace new ideas because you have the usual suspects making the policy. Do you worry about that? Do you see that happening uh, in Afghanistan and Pakistan if the context is one of creating uh, of quagmire? Sure. Every time we face one of these crises, the answer or the policy is quite predictable. We have a problem from hell. What do you do with a problem from hell? You certainly don't walk away from it because then you lose, you get accused of losing, uh, you've been defeated, America's been defeated, you're finished, personally and politically. So they invariably choose the middle way. And the middle way is to do more of what you've been doing and to try to do more better. And then after a year when it hasn't had much effect, you do even more and you try to do it even better. And you keep hanging in there, waiting for something to turn up so you don't have to lose. And then all of a sudden you find yourself fighting a seven-year war and a 10-year war and so forth. Uh, I go by the notion that strategy and policy demand that we make attainable objectives. We can't set objectives we can't uh, achieve. It's foolish, it's self-defeating. So in Afghanistan, I do not think we can rebuild the nation. And even though Obama says, oh, that's not our goal anymore, well, it is. Because uh, even though he says we're focused just on preventing the return of Al Qaeda, in order to prevent the return of Al Qaeda, he's trying to build the Afghan nation. Mm -hmm. It's the old Bush objectives coming in through the back door. They're all there in his strategy statement. And I say we can't do that sort of thing. Uh, we can't go do Katrina. Our public schools have fallen apart. Our infrastructure, technological and physical, is in, the, is in the drain. And we can go and fix up another country. It doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. So I would look to a strategy that would be based on things we can do mm -hmm. and objectives we can reach. We can't ensure that Al Qaeda will never return to Afghanistan. And even if, the, even if we did, even if we stay there forever to ensure that, Al Qaeda could attack us right now from Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we've got to do the things we know how to do. We know how to divide and conquer. The British did it for several hundred years quite successfully. Mm -hmm. uh, we can rent Taliban. The other bad guys have rented Taliban. Let's us go rent them now. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, <clears throat> we can give friendlies in uh, Afghanistan a boost, let them know they've, they've got some time, but then afterwards the combat is going to be up to them. It's going to be up to them to fight for their freedom. You, there should be a law, Harry, that says the United States shall not fight uh, for harder for another country's freedom than they're willing to fight for themselves. They don't want their mothers, daughters, sisters ruled by the Taliban again. They should fight to the death. Mm -hmm. I would. Well, let's give them the wherewithal to do it. And then, as far as the terrorists are concerned, let's use the same principles we used with the Soviet Union and China, containment and deterrence. We can do those things. Mm -hmm. Now, now uh, as a political scientist, uh, I'm, I'm pleased that you seem to be going back <laughs> to the theoretical roots in helping us understand our present situation. But, but the, is it, how do we get over the problem of your demons that you mentioned? Because in the end, if Obama were to say, or to follow your course of action, right. then he would be slammed by the cable networks, by the Republicans who seem right. to have no ideas. So, so what, what is the answer here? He'd be slammed by the Democrats who say you're abandoning the women of Afghanistan. Right. Right. So, so is, is now, now in, these, in these cases that we talked about, Truman and, and Kissinger and Nixon and, and Baker and, and W, uh, I'm sorry, not Baker and his father, uh, uh, Bush one, they rose above that. They but, did. But, but what, is there some link here between the concrete case and the, and the, the, the general principles that, that you're finding in what you learned maybe as a graduate student? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, I learned the whole rest of my career. Yeah. Because I think, as I said, most of the problems were solvable by common sense, and then I saw how they were twisted mm -hmm. uh, beyond reality by these demons. And when the demons are vanquished, it's by a president and a team uh, that's very adept at leadership and political maneuver itself and has a lot of courage and is willing to go out and make the case to the people and to take the verbal abuse that will follow. Mm -hmm. Most of the verbal abuse is nonsense. Hmm. Uh, I mean, just he, today you listen to all these people saying, we've got to stop the North Koreans from, from testing. Well, what are they proposing to do? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't somebody ask them? Mm -hmm. You want to go attack North Korea? Mm -hmm. The ones who want that least are the South Koreans. Ask them what they would do mm -hmm. in a practical way. So you got to go out and you got to do battle. And not just the, the president for uh, a choice, a policy, a strategy that's essential, particularly today, mm -hmm. uh, but the moderates in the country. See, the moderates understand what we're talking about exactly. They understand common sense. It's been the roots of America. That's, a, that's really what's distinguished us uh, in the last several hundred years. Uh, we could solve problems pragmatically. We've lost that skill. Sully Sullenberger lands his plane in the Hudson mm -hmm. River so that, successfully, uh, and he's a hero because mm -hmm. he did his job. He did something Americans used to do in a matter of course. The moderates have got to fight. Mm -hmm. uh, moderates, almost by definition, are, how shall I put it, moderate. Mm -hmm. So they don't fight. And the other guys who control the demons, they take over the battlefield. Particularly at this moment in our history, Harry, the moderates have to go out into the battlefield themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, moderates have been an endangered species, and species, and maybe they've they've lacked the leadership, which maybe we now have. I, I, you know, one of the things that, as I follow what's going on in the international economy, and I follow uh, uh, the uh, situation in some of these security th things, it, it seems to me that it's very important. And I want your insight here. Can people? who were part of making the mess or didn't do anything when the mess was made, how do they turn and actually become a positive force? Uh, is it the ideas that make the difference? Is it, is it that they now see a new reality that they didn't see uh, before? Are you confident that we are producing the leaders that can turn against the ideas that they have been promoting in the past? Yeah, well, I don't know that they can turn against their own ideas, especially when they're in power. When you're in power, you just, 
you're selling whatever you thought of at the last White House meeting, and you're in the bunker and you're protecting yourselves, and uh, them what ain't with you is against you very quickly. It's hard to get ideas in there. It's hard to get reality in there. Uh, I, I look mainly to younger people. I've had a lot, a lot of contact with younger people in the last 15 years at the council and subsequently with 40, now 40-somethings. 40 and there is a, a great uh, pool of talent there. It's a good generation. Uh, they just have to be willing to put themselves on the line for common sense, for pragmatic problem solving, and not be afraid to take the consequences. You know, it, it is a problem. Look, you, you know it here in academia. What, what are pu public intellectuals supposed to do? Uh, we're not supposed to be cheerleaders. Uh, we're supposed to be prodding those with power to think through what they're doing that will affect us all to make sure they've thought through the problems, uh, carefully looked at the alternatives. And uh, the people with power don't like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they tend to be derisive and uh, dismissive about, about this. But that's our job. And uh, it's the job of these younger people to take on the fight. Otherwise, they can see what's happening, the deterioration of the schools and the economy and the, the evolution of a country that is far less attractive, far less important in the world than the one we grew up in. Well, on that note of, of hope, I think, actually, Les, I want to thank you uh, very much uh, for being here. I'm going to show our audience your book, Power Rules, How Common Sense Can Rescue American Foreign Policy. And I want to urge them to buy it but to read the whole book and not rely on, on the reviews or the snippets uh, from an interview. Uh, and so again, thank you very much for coming on our program and Enjoyed writing the it, book. Harry. Thank you, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.